Hi, this is Sarit Schwetzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your Creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 513 for the 28th of Nissan in a regular year. So I want to begin today's episode by telling you guys a story of the time that I saw Jackie Mason in a restaurant in Crown Heights. So I was in Basil, which is a famous restaurant in Crown Heights with a friend of mine, and we were eating supper. And all of a sudden, there was something in the restaurant changed. There was like a palatable difference in the ambiance of the restaurant. It's difficult to explain it even in words. Like there was a, there was a sense like we heard like kind of like mumbling. We heard like people shifting around in their seats or something, you know, something was going on. We, there was clearly something unusual going on and we weren't really sure what it was. So we turn around and my friend says to me, she's, she said, oh, look, Jackie Mason just walked into the restaurant. And then I looked up and lo and behold, there was Jackie Mason, famous Jackie Mason. So it was a really interesting experience because Jackie Mason is just a person like you or I, right? <laughs> He's not a God or anything like that. He's just a person albeit he is a very famous person. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that when he walked into that room, there was a palatable sense in the room, the way people were poising themselves, the way people were holding themselves, the direction of their focus shifted in the very instant that he walked into that room. There was an instant sense of recognition he has a very distinct face. Maybe his clothing were very distinct. The suit he was wearing, the clothing he's wearing is very distinctively him. Like there's sort of like this signature look that Jackie Mason has. Imagine if it were Steve Jobs walking into the room, all the more so, right? There would be that famous black turtleneck, those signature glasses. So it's really interesting. We don't tend to think about this a lot, but people that we are know that we know, very well known and respected people, we tend to identify them by very superficial things, by their clothing, by their uh, their facial characteristics and things like that. However, at the same time, what it is that we're recognizing about them, the way that we behave differently about them, the reason why we behave differently when we're around them is not because of the clothing that they're wearing. Like if you took Steve Jobs turtleneck or if you took Jackie Mason's suit and you put it on a regular Joe Schmo who were to walk into the same restaurant, people would not be treating this person with the equal level of respect, right? So it's not the suit that we are revering so to speak. It's not the glasses that we're wearing, the turtleneck or those things. It's the inner aspect of the person. It's their their vitality and the suit or the glasses or the distinctive face or whatever it is, the makeup sometimes. These external garments merely represent to us who this person is on the inside. And what it is that we're attracted to in these people are is their vitality. And we can see this very tangibly in the sense that if any celebrity type of person like this were to be sleeping or were to, for example, Steve Jobs, he's not alive anymore. We don't have if obviously if somebody were to bring in like the casket of Steve Jobs, maybe people would st- still have like a certain level of reverence for him, but it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't, people wouldn't be like straightening their, their backs and being self-conscious and worried about how they look and that kind of thing. So when the person is, their life isn't there anymore, when their vitality is gone, when their consciousness is gone, it doesn't elicit the same level of self-consciousness of respect out of the audience as it usually does. So this is proof to us that it's not just the externalities that we're drawn to, but it's actually the inner part of our being. 
So how does this relate to Tanya and why am I bringing this all up? Well, so this is the exact topic that we're going to be talking about today. And for context, we're still in the middle of chapter 42 of Likutei Amarim. And we're going to talk about it in relation to God. And we're going to talk about it in relation to how we can once again cultivate this sense of fear and awe and respect for God, which is something that has been the topic of a lot of the chapter today. So we've talked a lot about this idea about how we really, one way that we can develop and cultivate this sense of fear and awe of God is by thinking about God in the sense that we think of a physical king. And the same way that like when we have an awareness of a physical king and that a physical king walks into the room, then we stand up and we straighten our backs and we act differently because we have this awareness of the power of the king and, and uh, maybe the wisdom of the king and all of those kind of things and the 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 control that the king might have over our lives. But so there's one thing that's very distinct about the analogy of the king that seems not to be present in the sense of God, which is that everything we've been discussing, that when a king walks into your room or a CEO of a company or a Steve Jobs or a Jackie Mason, when they walk into the room, we recognize them right away. We see them. We recognize them through their clothing. We recognize them through their facial characteristics and those kind of things. In the analogy, in the analog, when it comes to God, we don't see God. As much as some people can claim to be very spiritually attuned and that kind of thing, we don't actually see God. None of us can claim to, to say that they see God. Or if they do, then we usually start to question their sanity. Like this isn't a normal human experience to see God in a visual, tangible way, the way we do see these physical people of flesh and blood. So how does this fit? How are we supposed to cultivate this fear of God in the way that we cultivate the fear of a human of flesh and blood. So what the altar will teach us today is that the same way that I recognize, he doesn't talk about Jack, Jackie Mason, obviously, but it's a similar type of thing, that the same way that I was able to recognize that there was something going on, that there was somebody important that walked into the restaurant just by merely sensing the energy of the people around me, so too explains the Alter Rebbe, can we look at the world around us and see the way that the world behaves and see the way the different hosts behave and see how they are orienting themselves towards this reverence of God. So to be specific, the Alter Rebbe will actually talk about the heavenly bodies and talk about the planets and talk about how they are oriented to the West, how they're, they're kind of moving westward, so to speak. So we know that like the sun, for example, it rises in the east and it sets in the west. And the ultra will we'll talk about how actually by nature, their nature is actually to move eastward. But the fact that they move westward is proof to us that they're, what are they doing in the west? They're bowing to God because we know that the Shekhinah, the divine presence dwells in the, in the west. So the same way that if we really look at the world and observe the world in a, in a kind of like objective way and we, we see this happening the same way that I was able to recognize that there was something going on in the restaurant by the way other people in the restaurant were behaving. If we look at the world and we look at the reverence that these heavenly bodies have for the world, for God in their orientation westward, this can give us a sense that something is going on and can give us a sense of the grandiosity of God. And we'll also talk about how this is related to the word that we use in Hebrew for faith, namely emuna, which is again, the Hebrew English translation is always a little bit tricky because it's never exact because we say that the word, em word emuna means faith, but really it actually comes from the root of uman, of somebody who is a practitioner, somebody who has a discipline of a certain sort. So this is something that we need to cultivate through habit, through habituating ourselves, through developing a discipline of trying to, to really see this awareness, uh, see what's going on in the world. This is what's going to give us this sense of emuna. So let's get into the text and see how the Alter Rebbe explains this. So the Alter Rebbe says that in addition to everything that we've been learning so far, we should also rem remember this, that just like a, a king of flesh and blood, the main thing of uh, the fear that we have for him is for his inner essence, for his vitality. And not we're not scared of the body of a king. Because, for example, when a king is sleeping, we're not scared of him. We're only scared of a king when he's awake, when his vitality is very much there and present. However, this inner essence of the, the king and this vitality of the king is not seen. We don't see the king's vitality in a visible, tangible way. 
we only see this in like a more intellectual kind of like we sense it, you know, it's kind of like an intuition that we sense that there's something very special about this person called the king. Uh, or, you know, I, people sense there's something special about a celebrity, so to speak, or, or Steve Jobs or Jackie Mason. And we sense this through our physical eyes. So we sense this through looking at his body, through looking at his clothing, because we know that the vitality of the person is vested within that person. So for example, like going back to, and this is me giving a little bit of a tangent here, like what if I were to um, see this Jackie Mason type person walk into the restaurant and we all sell it's Jackie Mason type person walking into the restaurant and it turns out it was a Jackie Mason lookalike. So, and it wasn't actually Jackie Mason. So while that still would be kind of cool and be like, oh my gosh, you look just like Jackie Mason, blah, blah, blah. It wouldn't give that same sense. We'd kind of all relax after a minute or two because in realization that it's not really them. So as much as we see the, the flesh and blood of the person, the body of the person, the clothing of the person, that represents to us who the person is. What we're really attracted to is their vitality, to their life, to their to their inner essence. And then the altar goes on to say that this is exactly how we are supposed to fear God through seeing with our tangible physical eyes of flesh and blood in the heavens and in the earth and in all of the heavens, how the light of the infinite God is vested within them in order to give him vitality. So basically what the altar is saying here is that just like when we talk about Jackie Mason, let's go back to that. Even though the altar was says a king, I think what's more relatable is someone like Jackie Mason. Jackie Mason's essence is embodied in his very distinctive features, in his very distinctive face, in his very distinctive clothing and all of that. For God, he, his vitality, his essence is vested within the heavenly hosts within all of the heavenly bodies. And now here, the altar is going to give a little bit of a, a note here. He, he has a note in brackets to get into this a little bit more where he says that this is actually see, we see this to the naked eye that when they, we actually see this to in, with our physical eyes that they are, we see that these heavenly hosts are actually nullified to God's light in the sense that they bow down every day westwards when they, when they go down, when they set. So again, like for the sun, for example, that sets in the West. So that's like figuratively speaking, what they're actually doing is they're bowing to God. And this is what the sages taught about the idea that the Tzva HaShemayim, the host of heaven, bow down to God, bow down to you, God, because the Shechina, the, the divine dwelling is in the West. And we find that every day there motion is westward they're going towards the west and this is the way that they're bowing and this is the and this is their way of nullification and thus even somebody who never saw a king at all in their whole life and doesn't know the king at all nevertheless when they would go into the courtyard of the king and they would see that all the bowing down to the to this one man then they will get a sense of fear and awe so Again, going back to my analogy of Jackie Mason and Basil Restaurant, let's say I didn't know who Jackie Mason was. Let's say I never heard of him before in my whole life. Nevertheless, when I would see all the people in the restaurant treating this man with a certain level of respect and acting differently when he was in the room, it would give me a sense that there was something special about this person, even if I knew absolutely nothing about him or I never heard of him in my life. So similarly here too, what the altar was teaching us is that by looking at these heavenly bodies and looking at their orientation westward, this should give us a sense that there's something special about the West. There's something there. And that, says the Altarabe, is the divine presence. And now the Altarabe goes back to the regular text the, on the inside. And he says that, and even though God is vested within many, many different garments, then there's still no difference at all in the sense of being fear, of fearing a king of flesh and blood, whether he is naked or whether he is wearing one garment or whether he is wearing many garments. But the main thing, or whether he's wearing many garments. So again, going back to Jackie Mason analogy. So if Jackie Mason were to come in in, in a sweatshirt, you know, in sweatpants or something like that, or if he were to wear a costume or something, as long as we could recognize that it was still him, we still would have that sense that it's Jackie Mason and we still have that same respect for him, which would not be the case if there would be a regular person, some Joe Schmo from who knows where, wearing Jackie Mason's clothing. It wouldn't, give the same effect. So again, it's emphasizing the point that it's not about the clothing. The person can be wearing a little bit of clothing, a lot of clothing, different types of clothing, but 
it's it's not the clothing. It's it, the clothing is mirroring. The person is still there within the clothing, just like God is still there, whether he has a little bit of clothing, lots of clothing, whatever it is. And then the ultra but concludes this point here by saying that the main thing is to really accustomize ourselves, to really habituate our minds, to really habituate our das, our, our knowledge and our thoughts always to be really implanted within our hearts and within our minds always that everything that we see with our flesh and blood eyes, whether it's heaven, whether it's earth, it's the earth and everything filling all the earth. These are all just garments, external garments for the king, for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for the Holy One, blessed be he. And so when we look around at our life, when we look around at the world around us, we should really just see God everywhere. We should recognize that these are merely all just different garments of the king. And through this, we should always remember that their true internal essence, their true vitality is also encompassed in the Lashon, in the language of Emuna. So again, Emuna, this is that word. It literally means faith or belief, but really it comes from the root em- Uman, which is the lashon, the it, it's etymologically related to the lashon of habituating yourself, like somebody who has a practice, like an uman is somebody who is a practitioner of a certain trade, like a tradesman. So it's like we're really habituating ourselves. So a person is habituating themselves like a person who has a certain trade. So our trade in the sense is to habituate ourselves in recognizing God throughout the world. And then the altar Arabic goes on to say that also, in addition to everything we've been learning so far, namely about thinking about God as a king or ta- thinking about God as a famous person and seeing how everything in the world are the garments of God and recognizing God in, in the greatness of creation. So in addition to all of these kind of exercises, one must at the same time always remember that which the sages taught that we should all accept upon ourselves that we should have acceptance of the yoke of kingdom upon ourselves which is really the the idea of this idea of this law that we were given in Devarim chapter 17 verse 15 of som tasima lecha melech that you should anoint for yourself that you should appoint for yourself a king as we explained earlier in the Tanya this so we've been talking about this idea previously of using using like the visualization of a king and understanding our relationship with the king as a par- parallel to be able to understand our relationship with God. Because why? Why should we think about God as a king? Like, why is this an apt analogy to use in terms of thinking about God? Is because a king sets aside all of the world, all of the higher worlds, all of the lower worlds, and he unifies his kingship to us. Like, he he uniquely puts his focus on us. And we accept this so it's like imagine if like you had a very very powerful person in the world like one of the most powerful people in the world if imagine like elon musk you know it's maybe the closest thing that we can think of or the president of the united states somebody very very powerful who had all the power in the world and could focus on anything and they chose to focus on you and your little town your little city your little family and you specifically as an individual that's basically what god is doing god is the greatest king of all yet he chooses to focus on us so it's our duty to respond to him and our duty to serve him and this is the idea of when we bow down in the tefillah of shmonesra this is the idea of accepting the yoke of heaven when we do this so this is the idea of the bowing down that we do in the in the prayer of Shmonesra and the Amida prayer. After we accept the yoke of heaven in uh, in speech, when we say it out loud in Kriyashma, like when we first we begin in the prayer and we say Kriyashma, then we go back and we review this acceptance that we have when we bow down in Shmonesra, when we, when we bow. That it's basically like us saying that we are actually... And in reality and in truth, accepting upon ourselves the yoke of heaven, the yoke of God in action for real, as is explained more elsewhere. So that's it for today. So maybe just a quick review of the basic point, which is that just like we recognize a king or any famous person, in my case, it was Jackie Mason, we recognize them by their very distinctive features, by their body, by their face, by their clothing that they wear. Uh, by you know all of those distinctive signature traits that they have nevertheless it's not the traits it's not the external garments that we are drawn to 
Nevertheless, these external garments are very necessary because these external garments is what makes us recognize, oh, this is Jackie Mason, this is Steve Jobs, this is a king, whoever it is. And so similarly, when it comes to God, if we want to recognize God in the world, we need to recognize the garments that he wears. We need to figure out what God's signature look is, so to speak. And the truth is God's signature look is everywhere because everything in the world, whether it's heaven, whether it's earth, whether it's the ocean, whether it's a store, whether it is a house where we live at home, all these things are merely just different types of garments that God vests himself within. And the true essence of God is really found within all of these different garments. So, and the more we, and what we're called upon to do, says the ultra bit, is really to habituate ourselves into this way of thinking, just like a practitioner of any trade would do. And this is why the word emuna, which we commonly call, use in the simplest de definition to mean belief or faith, is related to the word uman, because it uh, uman is a tradesman and it's a practitioner. And then we went on to emphasize this idea of accepting the yoke of God, accepting the idea of subservient, being subservient just on a simple level. Like there's something virtuous about just being subservient, even if it doesn't, doesn't make sense, even if it's not something that's born out of intellectual uh, analysis or in contemplation and that kind of thing. There's something valuable and something that is necessary about just accepting day after day after day that yoke of heaven on a purely simplistic level. So that is it for today and we will continue tomorrow. We begin chapter 43 and I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Abraham Yitzhak Ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.